So brothers, sisters, please. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. As-salatu as ala Rasulil Kareem. And I said that road, peace and blessing upon the noble prophet Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, just before we broke off, our dear brother, Dr. Ahmed, spoke on the topic does Islam promote or prevent terrorism? And he elucidated going back all the way back to the 7th century of the common era from the time of the Prophet وسلم, and he started off in the year 610 and then he came all the way to the present. So it was a very broad overview as far as Islam is concerned and how it deals with terrorism. And if I am to very briefly summarize his speech, he dealt with three main concepts. One, justice two, peace, and three, equality. And he also mentioned the, the S, self-improvement, society, self-defense, saving lives. And he closed off by emphasizing that Islam do not support terrorism, it do not promote terrorism, it actually fights and stand against terrorism. So what we will do now is that we will move into the question and answer session. And I would just like to advise that when we are asking our question that we try as much as possible to stick to the topic, which is does Islam promotes or prevents terrorism and try to be as precise and to the point so that we can get as much questions and answers as possible. So without any further ado, I would like now to open the floor. Um, and well, it's a small, fairly small crowd, so you can ask a question. I don't know, are we taking up any terrific questions? Yeah, so in a little while, some brothers will pass around with people for those who may want to write their question down, and for those other people who may want to ask the question, feel free. So I open the floor now for questions. Yes?
and seeing the actions of some misguided Muslims and they may be associate, associating that with Islam, with Quran, with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace of, peace of Allah be upon him. So for the sake of completeness, please if you could give me 10 more minutes, right, inshallah. All right. Uh, when we look at the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there were so many people, so many empires, in so many countries and cultures, they were preying on the Muslim state, Islamic, the true Islamic state, and they want to dismantle it. For whatever reason. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had to fight defensive battles. So he took part in about 27 to 28 of them. But look at this. Islam teaches that Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, they do not kill women and children and non-combatants, even in the midst of the war. So he was very careful not to touch, not to harm, and not to kill any innocent people. We cannot destroy the properties, the resources, the water, electrical resources. There is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima, Nagasaki in Islam. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, he took part in many defensive wars. So look at this, right? Just in last century, in World War I and World War II, especially World War II, there were this many people, 10 million people, who took part in World War II. And look at the number of casualties that happened. And most of them are innocent civilians. So our modern wars, modern weapons, the nuclear, the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, with all the weapons that we have, we don't have the etiquettes of war to save the civilians, the women, the children, and the non-combatants. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was so careful that, look at this, in all of the battles that we had, about 28 campaigns, 28 battles and 38 campaigns, the number of people, the casualties, and these were the soldiers, about 1,200 of them, that's it in all of the 23 years of his prophethood. So look at the number, 1.5% casualties compared to 351% casualties in the modern warfare without the ethics, the morality, and the guidance of God. So, so I hope and pray that this is a very stark statistics that how careful Islam is. We should be avoiding the war, and as a last resort, if the war is imposed on you, the Quran says, chapter 2, verse number 190, as I mentioned before, do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers, how careful that they were. So now, a question may come in, that how come some Muslims are committing acts of violence? It's a very legit question. So let's take a look at that, by the way. Who is that man? Jim Jones. And the photo next to him is what? The KKK. KKK, they say that they represent Christianity in their charter, in their churches, in their allegiance. Jim Jones, in the name of Christianity, 800 plus people, his followers, the cult, they died of the Kule. Do they represent Christianity? Should we judge Christianity by the actions of them? We should not, right? We should not. Christianity is a faith that, that teaches peace. Just like we cannot judge KKK, or Hitler, or the Crusaders, or the Spanish Inquisition, or the slave traders, done in the name of Christianity, in the same way, no one should judge Islam, Quran, and the noble life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by what is going on in the Middle East, or by the actions of some misguided people. I hope that it's very, very clear. Actions of people, People are fallible. Quran is infallible. Quran promotes peace, justice, and equality. So with saying that, that, some of you may be still asking the question that, 
you know, but how come Muslims are fighting there? Why is there violence? How come some people are committing atrocities? Let's take a look, by the way. According to the Peace Institute, they did a survey. They found out that about 30 battles are happening in the year right now. Right now in the world, about 30 battles. Majority of them, 86% of the battles, according to the survey or according to the data that they compiled, they were not based on religion, they were based upon removing the oppression, removing the false economic system, or the dictatorship, or some other socio-economic causes. Not religion, majority of them. That's a very important point. Let's take a look at this, by the way. It's a human nature that people, if they oppress them, atrocities are committed on them, day after day, time after time, families get destroyed, drone missiles and air strikes and oppression and dictatorship, people are human beings. Suppose if somebody destroys your home, bomb coming from Guyana, for example, how would we feel? How would you feel? You would feel angry. It's a human emotion. That's how the people up there, they feel exactly the same way. But remember this, by the way. Islam is so careful that Islam does not give the right, the permission, or the okay for the Muslims. That even if they, the enemy, kill your innocent people, even then Islam is so careful that we cannot touch or kill their innocent people. And that is what Islam stands for. But obviously, oppression, occupation, violence, they all give rise to anger, vengeance, grievance. And if it boils over, it gives rise, obviously, to violence. So that's the cycle of violence, unfortunately. That's the cycle of violence. So does it matter if you see that in China, see that in South Africa, see that in Ireland, see that in Bosnia, see that in Middle East? That's how human beings react. So Islam condemns any violence, by the way. I'm not saying that that's an excuse for violence. We want to understand what is going on. Unless and until we know the cause of violence, we cannot eradicate violence. So the cause of violence is not the Quran, the Quran speaks against it. It's not the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He stood for peace, justice and equality. The cause for violence is oppression. The cause for violence is dictatorship, the drone missiles, the air strike, all of them giving rise to anger and vengeance. Now, look at this here. This speaks a lot. Why do you think they're angry, right? And this is for the Muslims, drawn by a non-Muslim, to educate the non-Muslims. But why do you think Muslims are angry? Is it because people stole their resources? You know, dictatorship, dictatorships were installed on them? You know, funding the enemies? Drone missiles killing so many people? So it's very important. Human beings. We have families, we have property, we have loved ones. If they are snatched away from us, or they are calm, people get angry. Anger sometimes boils over, and sometimes people take things in their own hands. Islam condemns, condemns any violence done in the name of Islam or in the name, in the name of any ideology. So that's not an excuse, that's an understanding of why violence is happening. So. When we look at the statistics in the USA, by the way, majority of the violence in the USA, they're not done by Muslims. Let's take a look at this. Last year, 2015, there were 365 acts of violence, or gun violence actually, or mass shootings in the USA. 365, like almost one each single day. Only three of them, they were done by Muslims, misguided Muslims. When I say three, our hearts should cry for every single one of them. But the only reason I'm saying three is because I'm comparing three to the 362 which were done by people of other faiths, nationality, any causes. 
media. Even if one Muslim commit any violence, maybe one murder, they should not have been committing any harm by the way. But if misguided Muslim commits one thing, there's wall-to-wall -wall coverage, right? Morning to evening, breaking news, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Media wants to know who are the parents, what mosque that he goes to, what imam that he was radicalized with, and they go and search his home, emails, internet site, and all the connections. And then we think that only Muslims are committing violence, and we forget. We forget. Take a look at this. From 2001 until last year, 406,000 deaths by gun violence in the U.S. The red line that you see up here, non-Muslims. The blue line that you see up here, including 911, if you attribute 911, right? There's no evidence there right now, by the way. Even if we attribute there, even then, look at the stark difference. 3,000 compared to close to half a million. Even Muslims with whatever state that they are in, we are still in the USA, the most peaceful people, with the least divorce rate, the most engaging in the society, the most charitable in the society, the highest percentage of doctors and lawyers and uh, people who are benefiting the society, even with all the faults of the Muslims. So it's very important that let's not have the media fool us. When you see somebody committing violence, we have to think right away. Are they doing it in the name of Islam? If they're doing it in the name of Islam, then obviously they're doing, they're committing something which is wrong. Look at this here. Since the last 2,500 years, these are all the wars, the battles that happened around the world. All the dots that you see up there. Each dot is a war, a battle. Take a look at this. Majority of them are where? Away from the Muslim land. Mostly in Europe, mostly in the USA. Away from the Muslim land. So even when you look at history, in the last 4,000 plus years, or even in the last 500 years, last 100 years, majority of them, they were not Muslims. How about last, last century, by the way? It were not the Muslims who started World War I. 17 million innocent people died. It were not the Muslims that started World War II. 54 million people died. It were not the Muslims who took part in the Vietnam War. 5 million people died. Not the Muslims who dropped the bombs Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 300,000 civilians died. Not saying that Muslims are angels. They're good and bad in the followers of any faith, but it's very important. We should not judge any faith by the actions of some misguided individuals. So in closing, my dear Muslims, my dear guests, Islam promotes peace, Islam promotes justice and equality. Let's not have the media fool you. If you want to know what Islam is, pick up a copy of the Quran and study the noble life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you do that, you will find out that yes, Islam can benefit you. Islam will benefit you the way it has benefited humanity all through our centuries. Islam will bring peace in your life. You will connect with the Creator without any mediator. Islam will provide solutions in your life, in the life of your families. Islam will provide solutions for the people of Trinidad and all of humanity. But the best, the most important benefit, my dear guest, that Islam could help you with. Is that when you stand in front of God on the day of judgment, inshallah, God willing, you can say, when the question is going to ask to you that who did you worship? And you could say that yes, God, I only worshiped you. I only followed the guidance, the manual that you have sent. And inshallah, God willing, God by his mercy will induct you and me into eternal paradise. With that, Jazakallah khairan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now we could take the questions. Inshallah. Okay, so there is a question over here, by the way, right? There's a question over here. 
ISIS claims to be an Islamic entity and rule an Islamic state. What do you say is very different from what they do? How would you explain? Okay, it's very important. I'm going to make a general statement, by the way, because I don't know what is going on in the Middle East. All we know is through the media. And the media may be right, it may be wrong. We cannot hold anything the media is saying with 100% truth. Whatever some group may be doing, if they are doing it according to the Quran and the peaceful teachings which are projected from here and from the Sunnah, example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then we can say that yes, what they are doing is right. But if somebody is using the name of Islam or the Sharia law or any Arabic terminology and they are suppressing women, taking the rights away from the non-Muslims, forcefully converting the Muslims, we say that any group, doesn't matter what they call themselves, what state they call themselves, if they go against the Quran, in the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, we say that they are on the wrong path. We want to educate them, we want to pray for them, and obviously we want to make sure that they start following the Quran and the Sunnah, so they can rectify it, and the region could be rectified. Right? So that's what I would say, that this is the guideline, this is the template. We could judge myself, all the Muslims, and any group out there. If they follow this, they are on the right path, on the path of the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, go ahead, please. Walaikum <laughs> salam. Because we love humanity, we want to share peace with humanity. So our Creator has mentioned in the Quran, in chapter 16, verse number 125. The invite all to the way of God with wisdom and good preaching, and converse with them in ways which are best and most gracious. So it's very important that we have to use our wisdom and also in nice, sweet speech, with a smile, kindness, forgiveness, not being harsh on them, not making them defensive, right? That was the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Before he started to preach the message of Islam, he was already called as the most truthful and the most honest. So the first and the foremost thing is, we have to be exemplary Muslims. We have to be exemplary Muslims, exemplary neighbors, exemplary students. That's what Islam teaches us. Exemplary means we have to be the elite in the society when it comes to morality, helping people out, the best neighbor, all these things. So once we have this credibility, then obviously you can connect with the person and the people and remind them about who the Creator is and the guidance that He has given to us. And one day we have to face the Creator. At that point we cannot come back to this life and do the things that we should have been doing this time. So in a nice way. Number two very important, as I mentioned before, Quran and Muhammad peace be upon him in his example, we have solutions for humanity's problems. So suppose if you see a person drinking, you can approach them and show them that yes, there may be some benefits, but there are more harms 
to him or her, to the family and the society. You know, that's what the Quran says, right? In chapter number 2, verse number 219, that in alcohol and in gambling, intoxicants and in gambling, there's a small benefit, but the harms outweigh the benefit. It clouds the person's mind. Alcohol is so many cancers from the medical perspective. It makes the person do and say things, later on they will regret. It is a factor in breaking down of many families, divorces. It's a factor in many sexual assaults and rapes. It's a factor in people doing more drugs. It's a factor in just overall destroying the society. So we have to nicely sitting down with them, building the rapport and the friendship, remind them that it's not good for them in this world, definitely it's not good for them when they face the Creator. Okay, so I hope and pray that uh, we continue your dawah, the outreach effect, and we will accept it from you and all of us. Here, here. Yes, um, many persons um, have been cited where Islam, Islam promotes peace and justice and it, um, it, it's against oppression, injustices and all those things. But these misguided Muslims, right, they are cited ayah from Quran to justify the atrocities. Can you um, expand on that please? Sure. So the question is, there are some misguided Muslims who are justifying their atrocities using some passages from the Quran. Now we know that there is no faith right now that promotes killing of innocent people, not that I know of. But almost people of almost any faith, a small number of people, right? They are committing atrocities and they are using their scriptures, their scriptures out of context. Andre Brovik, 2012, he killed 78 people in the name of Christianity. People in USA, they shoot and they kill the abortion doctors. Planned Parenthood clinics, four or five people died just recently. The monks, Buddhist monks, were supposed to be peaceful. Look what they are doing to the Muslims in Burma. Jewish people, you know, Goldstein, he went to a mosque in the name of Judaism, he killed about 36 worshippers. So it's not Quran, it's not the Sunnah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that is inciting them. This, this incites peace. If people come home from a clouded background, if they have some ulterior agenda for power and oil and friction and uh, secretarian violence, if they already bring that into the play, that means they can find anything out of context in any scriptures. So, there are certain passages in the Quran that speaks about fighting, right? Because Islam is not a pacifist faith, Islam is a peaceful faith. So there are verses in the Quran about fighting, and I mentioned some of those to you. Chapter number 2, verse number 190, 191, 192, 193. Chapter number 9, verse number 5, our favorite one, right? Surah Tawbah. There are many verses, but any verse in the Quran that speaks about fighting is in the context of a war, in the context of a just war, in the context of Muslim self-defense. So some people, may they be the Jews or the Christians, the Buddhists or the Hindus, they have taken scriptures out of context to satisfy their own agendas. So we have to educate our fellow non-Muslims and definitely have to educate the Muslims showing them the right context and the right historical context and the way Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, applied those verses. And we also have to teach that to our children, by the way, right? Because we have to educate them that yes, no matter what people are doing, no matter what atrocities are happening on them, their families or the Muslims, this is the guideline for our provides. In the context of a just war, declared by the Islamic State, we cannot take things into our own hands. And we have to make sure that we cannot harm, kill, or injure any innocent person. 
So these are the guidelines and we have to be careful when we speak to any non-Muslim that there are verses about war in the Quran but in the context of a war. Violence in the context of a war or fighting in the context of a war. You know, some of you may be from the Christian perspective, right? Or from the Jewish perspective. Almost all the scriptures that I know, they have a concept of a just war. For example, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse number 3, 15, verse number 3, it speaks about war. Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he was commanded by God to conduct war, a just war. So was Joshua, so was Solomon. So the Old Testament is filled with wars. But again, any fighting is in the context of a just war. Does it matter Old Testament, New Testament, the Vedas, and definitely the Quran. services, humanitarian services, relief services, medical clinics, 
lawyer services were out there having a peaceful, positive face of Islam in the community. We also invited the media. We did our best. We wanted also the media to carry on this message. I'm not sure if anybody came from the media, by the way. <laughs> when we started the program, we started the program with a very important greeting. The greeting was, peace of God be upon you. Uh, that means you are protected here in our peace. We give you security, your protection, and the peace. So, next time hopefully bring your friends. But we are trying to do what we are. Obviously more and better things needs to be done. But it's very important. There is also a responsibility on the non-Muslims. Just like the message to my Muslims would be, do not judge Christianity, but the 93,000 rapes in the USA each single year. See, when I was in India, I was born and raised in India, by the way, my only perception of USA was that everyone carries a weapon, everyone is violent, everyone kills each other every single day. But when I came to the US, socialized and connected with the people up there, educated myself, my false perception, it went away. So it's the responsibility for you, your friends, and our fellow brothers and sisters, non-Muslims in humanity, you also have a responsibility. God has given you also a mind to think and ponder and not to judge Islam or any faith by what you see on Fox News. Number one. Number two, it's very, very important. Atrocities which are done over there, even though there's no excuse for them, those atrocities are a reaction to the oppression done by the foreign powers on Muslims. So you have a responsibility as living in a country that you put pressure on your government and you put pressure, the government put pressure on the United Nations and stop the oppression which is out there. So it's not just the Muslims, by the way, you yourself, individual, and I'm saying in a nice way, right? So all of us have responsibility, not just the Muslims. At the end of the day, we are all brothers and sisters in humanity. We are, this is our earth, we all have to live here. If we are going to live here, we live by the guidance of God in peace and harmony, what God teaches. So along with the Muslims, yourself, your friends, all the people of Trinidad, all the people of the world, we have responsibility. So that's the message. If we all fulfill our responsibility, oppression not just in the Middle East will go away, but the guidance of God, there would be justice, and the outcome of justice would be peace. So I hope that as we play our role, I hope that you also play your role. So hopefully once you go back home from here, you can at least say that I met the Muslim people. They're good people. I hope you could say that. I hope you could write down on your Facebook that you enjoyed the samosa or whatever there is up there. I hope you could say that yes, I learned from a speaker quoting from the Quran, from the source, that Islam promotes justice, peace and equality. So each one of you, can and should become a spokesperson for peace. So you, my dear brother, does, do have a responsibility, just like sisters and the brothers over here. Fulfilling the responsibility, inshallah, God willing, the world will be a better place. If you have questions on the topic, it is good. If there is also outside of the topic, comparative religion or any other aspect, inshallah. Once we exhaust the questions on uh, the topic that we have, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. The only problem you face is that, uh, as you mentioned, the role of the media, uh, is that they redefine terms. Uh, they take our terms and they redefine it. And based on that redefinition, you know, they, they apply, you know, this is certain people meet that criteria. One of them is you know, jihad. Any Jogo picks up a gun and is a Muslim, that's jihad. It's contrary to the definition that we know for jihad and that you've explained today. Uh, 
The other thing I can't understand is why the public doesn't think a little bit. Every time an atrocity is committed, for example, in Belgium and France, uh, recently in the, uh, the nightclub in California and elsewhere, the media is saying the one hand that these people don't pray. They have a background in drug and robbery and whatnot, and they're calling them Muslims, not just Muslim, radicalized Muslim. Now, an extremist is someone who goes beyond. So I would define extremist as someone who is praying five times a day, not sleeping anything at night, only praying all night and day and so on. That's extremist. But these people are not even filling the minimum requirements, and then they're, then they're called a radicalized extremist. So I would like to tell you what is a when the, when the media talks about one of these people and says. Uh, they want to know where and how he was radicalized. You could tell everyone well, what they're thinking of, what is the process of radicalization in the eyes of media. What's the process of radicalization in the eyes of the media? Well, I'm not sure what is meant by that. Um, if the media personnel were here, they would be the best qualified people to come here and say that. But you raised a very important point, by the way. So let me touch upon one term that you raised, radical Muslim or radical Islam, as some people say up there. Sure. Uh, it's not going to say that thing. OK, it's very important. There is only one Islam that was brought or sent or given by God as guidance to humanity. Only one Islam. There is no such thing as conservative Islam, or radical Islam, or liberal Islam. There's only one Islam. Number one. Number two, if someone is going to say that radical Islam, just because one Muslim, misguided Muslim, committed an atrocity, so just to be fair, if a Christian does the same thing, the media has to use the same term, radical Christian. If they don't use it, that means you and me, we have the responsibility to correct the media. So either the media use it for every religion or they should not use it for any religion, including Islam. Make sense? So media is biased, so again, all of us, not only we have responsibility to put pressure on the politicians, but we have to correct the media. That means the youth, as you mentioned before, we have to make sure that some of us, we have to become journalists and broadcasters and enter into the media field. Because media is defining what Islam is and what Islam is not, and also the world view. So that's a very important point that all of us have humongous responsibility. You know, lecture after lecture, we can do it from now until eternity. But it's very important, we need to identify the cause, we need to correct the media, correct the government, we have to be a positive, peaceful face of Islam and of humanity to the world. And that's how we could, inshallah, God willing, through God's guidance, we could bring peace, justice, and equality, inshallah. If you have a follow-up question, you could. Okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Feel free. Any other question on Islamic theology or anything else, feel free to your or guest. We want to give you the chance, yes. I, I appreciate that very much. Sure. I would really like to stick as close to the topic as possible, which is concerning terrorism. Uh, because you made reference to Christianity, posted up uh, Jim Jones and the Ku Klux Klan and so on. Uh, I myself am not a Christian, I'm not affiliated, quite frankly. But you see, first of all, I think Christianity does get labeled when Christians go out and do some crazy stuff. But the word that was being used all the time was fundamentalist. Uh, Jim Jones was called a fundamentalist Christian. When you get somebody going to an abortion clinic and shoot any doctors, they said some crazy Christian fundamentals. And when the wars first started in the Middle East, that was the same terminology used towards Muslims. If you remember, CNN, BBC, all carried terms of fundamentalist Muslims. What you had was an association in your country, the United States, that objected and Islamic 
uh, organization that objected to that term being used towards Muslims. And somehow or the other, you got the word Muslim extremist turning up, which always confused me because I always figured if Islam is a religion of peace, shouldn't an Islamic extremist be extremely peaceful? <laughs> but I only put a question to you because I wish to represent the views of those outside of Islam as they see it. For everyone sitting here who is in fact Muslim, I'm sorry, but your view of the Islamic world is from inside of Islam. It's very difficult for you to see how people outside of Islam see Islam. And so, coming back to your point with the Christians, they have a book. And in that book, there is an obscure passage that says, anybody who handles a snake has bit by a snake. If he believes on Jesus Christ, nothing will happen to him. And so you've got some fundamentalists who up in the mountains. Every Sunday morning, they're passing them and snakes around, being bitten, some of them are dying. In the same way, you have a Quran that does have some, well, obscure verses. And you have people like al Baghdadi and all of these other guys who read these verses and say, yes, we are the true Muslims because we're following the Quran to the letter. They say, you guys are wishy washy Muslims because those verses that they follow the letter, you guys are pretending that it's not there in the Quran. So from the point of view of someone outside of Islam, their statements are already made, and I want to know that those guys are actually full Muslims, and you guys are the ones that have been civilized by modernity and have decided to not preach those verses when you get up in the mosque. And you preach only the ones about peace and love, which I am pretty much happy for here in Trinidad. But can you not see how the non-Muslim world can look at all these other, by the way, Boko Haram free the girls today, you know, you heard the news, all those girls have been freed by Boko Haram. Can you not see how the outside Muslim world can say, look, you're cherry picking the Quran, taking all the verses that you like, the nice ones, preaching it in the mosque, and the ones that you don't like, those are the ones that ISIS and others are using. Islam is a way of life. It's not a pacifist faith, it's a peaceful faith. Any oppression going on anywhere, we should be joining hands with good-hearted, good-minded people. So yes, there are places in the Quran that speaks about fighting. And any person can take anything out of context. And I cannot control, neither can you. A Christian may do it, or people of any faith. Now, what would be the deciding factor? Is it the opinion of some person in the Middle East, or the opinion of a scholar sitting in the Trinidad, looking at that same verse, right? Who is to decide about that verse about fighting? For example, the verse, chapter 9 of the Quran, verse number 5. It says that after the four months are passed, kill them wherever you find them. There is a verse like that in the Quran. However, however, we have to look that into context. So there was a treaty between the Muslims and different groups of the non-Muslims. The aggressors who broke the treaty, God is saying only for them that Muslims should fight them because it was part of the treaty that if they break the treaty, aggression should be done on them. Because they expelled the Muslims from their homes, they kill many Muslims and they are causing oppression. So for those people, because they broke the treaty and committed aggression, that verse was revealed. But then the following verse says, chapter 5, chapter 9, verse number 6, but if they cease and if they drop the weapons, you don't commit any atrocity on them. You take them to the state of safety. Means you don't just stay away from you also make sure that nobody harms them. You take them away to a place of safety so they may hear the words of God. So that's how careful Islam is. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he applied those verses in the just war that he fought. So it's very important. It's not the words of that person in the Middle East and this Imam in Trinidad, for example. The deciding factor is 
what is the context number one and how did Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him apply those verses so that would be the final criteria of how any passage in the Quran should be interpreted yes Right. To this gentleman here, do you know that there are extremists in Hinduism, Christianity, and other faiths? Why I say so? The, not the extremists or the Hindus, the Christians, etc., they want to only target Muslims as, as, uh, as extremists because of ISIS and because of a number of things. Do you know that Christian people rape Muslims? They, that they are extremists. Hindus do the same thing. They are extremists. They murder people. Right? We are not the only ones doing these things out of context. They are doing it out of context too. This is humanity. This is at large what the world presents. Only Muslims are targeted. And they are targeted, but the media will cover their faults and put our own faults into the forefront. Okay. Right? Alhamdulillah. Please ask your question. Assalamualaikum. Um, something that's been bothering me as a Muslim who's been for a long time, and as someone who grew up in the States, but um, this culture and tradition thing that we obviously override you sooner, how do we eradicate that? It's, it's like, I realize it's almost everywhere, but this culture thing, I know there's no, it's not supposed to be any culture in Islam. How do we eradicate that? How do you eradicate what? The culture and tradition. Yeah. Culture. And tradition. Culture and traditions. Simple way would be obviously to educate the people that Quran and the Sunnah, or the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, these are the two primary sources of Islam. If we are doing something that goes against any one of these two sources, that means we have to think. So I think that's the most important way is that if something contradicts the Quran and the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, that means we have to make sure that uh, we come back to the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad peace be upon him. Because Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he meant Quran mentions in the Quran, Quran mentions in chapter 33 verse number 21 that in the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, you have the best example to follow. For those who believe in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah much. So anytime if you are in doubt about what to do, how to follow, how to preach, how to interact, we go back to the Quran and the example of Muhammad peace be upon him. If we do that, we do find out that every single passage in the Quran, there is no passage in, in, in the Quran that incites violence. There's no passage in the Quran that incites disunity. There is no passage in the Quran that says Muslims should impose their belief on other people or to suppress the women. Obviously, there are passage after passages that goes the opposite that says freedom of speech, freedom of uh, religion to the people, equality of males and females in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, solutions for humanity's problems, for racism and drugs and breakdown of the family structure so i think holding to the quran and the example of prophet muhammad peace be upon him would be the way to go we have to educate ourselves try the best to do it and educate our youth inshallah yes if you could make it into a question i would really appreciate that inshallah yes. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, last sermon, um, one of the things he said was to bring this message better 
that I have brought it to you directly, referring to the people. Now, I'm looking at Palestine with the wars that has been going on for such a long time. We as Muslims, we certainly do speak out and say something about it. But from your point of view, I want you to tell me your view on that, what I just asked you about the statement of the Prophet who said for him after. In terms of his wars also in his time and the wars now, and how people respected him in the world and how people respect us now in this time. Thank you. In the last sermon of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's very important and this is very much relevant to us, by the way. I'm paraphrasing one statement that he made and he said that all the wars, the tribal frictions that people had and all the vengeance and the friction, dissolve them, end them, abolish them. Let's start with a new slate, with a new faith. Right? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He let go of all the vengeances of all the tribes. He united them, saying that no more war. So that's the example that he gave in the last sermon of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then he also mentioned to convey the message to those people who are not present. Right? So that's the job of Muslims, that the message of peace we convey not just to the Muslims and remind them of the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him, but to the people of all of humanity, that yes, do not just Islam by what the media is saying, read the Quran, look into the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. You'll be standing in front of God, doesn't matter what some Middle East people are doing, doesn't matter what the perception that you may have about Muslims, it's very important for you and for all of us. Ultimately, we have to die one day, and that's the reality, right? I mean, these lectures are important, but the ultimate reality is that we have to die one day. And before we die, it's even more important that we should know that there is a Creator who loves us. Love of the Creator means He would send us some guidance and He would protect the guidance. And we Muslims, we say that there is ample proof that Quran is the Word of God. This is the guidance protected by God. Just like a loving parent is not going to deprive the children of guidance, a loving creator has not deprived humanity, not just Muslims. This is not just for you and me, it's for all of humanity. So the ultimate question, the ultimate focus should be, how can we go to eternal paradise? Forget about some Muslims doing that, some Hindus doing that. They have to be, they would be held responsible on the day of judgment in the they have to be answerable to God individually and likewise you and me. You would be standing in front of God, so would I be. How did you live your life? Who did you follow? Did you worship a man and idol? Did you worship one God? Did you follow God's guidance? Did you try to unite the people the way God's guidance has recommended you? Did you start to promote and peacefully, proactively fought to end terrorism, end racism, end poverty, end women's oppression. So all of these things would be deciding factors that each one of you would be, should be asking ourselves. How would we respond to God on the Day of Judgment? On the Day of Judgment there would be only two choices, either paradise or hellfire. To go to paradise, obviously, knowing the Creator, following the guidance, Making mistakes, we repent to God. And God, by His mercy, inshallah, eternal paradise. All of the things, let's not have us get distracted by what the media may be saying and what perception that we have of Catholics or Muslims or Hindus. At the end of the day, they are responsible for what they do. You and me are responsible for what we do. So let's follow the God's guidance. Noble example of all the prophets, including the last one, Muhammad peace be upon him. If we do that, inshallah, we could create justice and peace in this world, eternal paradise by God's mercy in the hereafter. And that's, I believe, the final message from me to all of you, from Muslims to all of you, and from Islam to all of you. May God guide us and may God bless us.
Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before we close this, as uh, Idris said, this is the last public forum we're having in Trinidad. Tomorrow, inshallah, we spend the entire day in Tobago from 6 o'clock till 10 o'clock in the night, doing similar types of activities in Tobago, and then doing some street walkabout hour on Saturday, inshallah. So this week, from last week, Friday, until tonight, we have had many activities. We have had interfaith discussions, three of them. We have had public lectures, we have had TV interviews, we have had an article printed in the papers about Islam and terrorism. We have had a number of different activities. We have walked all over Trinidad and Tobago delivering packages to non-Muslims about Islam. So Alhamdulillah, this year, the Islamic Awareness Week has reached much further than some of the previous years, and we are very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too. And we want to say a special thanks to all of you who have supported the activities in one way or the other throughout the week. From tomorrow, inshallah, Dr. Sabil Ahmed, who has been here since Friday, we know he came in a little bit late because of Hurricane Matthew, so he had to divert um, the plane. Well, not him, he directed the plane, but the flight pattern. Um, so we, we had to take another flight just to get here in time for Saturday, um, alhamdulillah. And um, tomorrow he goes to Tobago, and first thing on, on Saturday morning he leaves. So we want to say it publicly on behalf of the Islamic Law Movement and the community of Trinidad and Tobago, a very heartfelt and sincere thanks to Dr. Sabil. This is the second time he has come. And alhamdulillah, I think uh, Dr. Sabil, everyone has been uh, very grateful for the quality of your presentation, for the depth and the level of discussion that you have been able to engage in over the past few activities, over the past few days. So I know when the last few interfaith activities, you were very upset that we didn't give you any gifts, and we gave you the speaker <laughs> gifts. So tonight, inshallah, we're going to finally present you with your gift from the Islamic law movement on behalf of the Muslim community, and our last brothers are here just to hand that to you, inshallah. So we have this one, we want to also stress one of the things that Dr. Sabil mentioned tonight was about Islam promoting, you know, social services, community activity. So after we come back from Tobago, inshallah, on Saturday, on Sunday, we have an, an environmental activity where we are going to Valencia River to help clean up and to, you know, make it uh, better for the users of the, of the location. So we want to invite you to come and be part of it and, you know, be Islam in action. So, we hope to see you again. We hope that you will continue to support our activities. The, the events that we have had will stream online and will remain online. So we will share the link on our Facebook and website, our Facebook page and website. So please continue to support the activities. If you want to get involved and you want to be part of the Islamic Law Movement, then come, of course, talk to us. And we will tell you exactly how you can get involved and how we can use your help. Shukran, Jazakallah, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>